Hi, we're back again with another look at some bizarre, strange tech from the mountain bike world. Uh, if you want to know what this is, check out last week's video if you've not already done it. Uh, we had a look at some pretty strange and obscure mountain bike tech. This week we check out a few more really cool, interesting items. Now bear in mind, some of this stuff went on to be nothing. Other stuff kind of morphed into what we have today. So it's all a bit of a nod at the great M2B tech of today. Well, let's dive in, shall we? I want to talk about brake torsion arms because these were some actually pretty tech tech as far as tech goes. How many times can I say tech in a sentence? Yeah, so you have brake torsion arms to basically control how your rear brake feels. Now picture going back to when downhill biking, the wheel travel size was started to, to really jump up. Now as an effect of that, you'd get some different handling traits starting to show on bikes. Now downhill bikes were famous for pedaling badly because they didn't have much in the way of anti-squat. You wanted the bike to feel as supple as possible the whole time to track the ground. Pedaling was less of an issue than overall control. So you've got some manufacturers bringing in inertia valves into shocks like Fifth Element. So this was cool because it gave you a pedaling platform so you could have a bike feel grippy uh, and you could pedal things. So that was taken care of. But on the braking side of thing, you'd also have effects of what happened when you're braking depending on what sort of suspension design you have on the bike. Now typically you've got one of two things would happen. You get brake squat or brake jack. Now brake jack you really do not want on a downhill bike because what happens is as you hit that rear brake it extends the suspension so you're effectively locking the suspension out and you're transferring body weight and position to the front wheel so you're loading up the front wheel more and you're extending the rear end your back end will be skipping around all over the place so that's not a good thing don't really want that. The opposite is a brake squat where as you hit the rear brake it actually digs in and the bike will squat down sort of uh, slightly maintaining geometry, you know, could be used for that if you're, your fork's diving, but under braking you can have rear squat, so that's a good thing. You can actually pull the back end into the terrain. But due to the amount of different sort of suspension configurations and where people were mounting their brakes, there was just so many different feelings on, on the rear suspension. Now, a lot of companies like GT with the Lobo had an almost floating brake mount at the rear to try and just isolate their brake from the suspension feel. And there's a few other systems out there like the Schwinn that you can see here, I think this one's a straight eight. Uh, they also had a kind of floating system there, basically just so the brake would have no effect on the rear suspension. Now Kona are one of the companies famous for bringing in a brake torsion arm, uh, they're called there's a dope arm system. Santa Cruz, as you can see on screen, had it on the original V10 for the same reason. But the one I want to talk about is the Fabian Burrell option. So he actually persuaded Kona to bring this, uh, the dope arm system, onto their what was called a faux bar design. They refer to it as a four bar, but technically it's a single pivot with a linkage to drive the shock. So at a glance it looks like a four bar, but the rear chainstay pivot was on the seat stay rather than on the chainstay, making it a single pivot. Anyway, their traditional braking point there would actually firm up the rear suspension, which they didn't want. So by putting a brake torsion arm on there, they could control what the brake did. Now on Fabian's bike, he had two mounting points for this brake torsion arm. One of them would keep the brake neutral, so it didn't affect the rear suspension, and that's brilliant. And that's basically what the position that went on to sale. But he also had a different position on there that would give it a severe amount of squat. Now this doesn't suit a lot of people, but if you're a racer at his level where you really want to cut some speed off the terrain like dramatically when you're racing, that's what he used the bike for and well basically he went on to win a world championship using a setup like that. So uh, brake torsion arms, very cool. Now you don't really see them too much these days because of the fact that suspension designs have changed, you get anti squat and things built into suspension designs now and basically people are working around it in different ways. However, we did spot a couple of years back the Team Saracen running one on their Saracen Mist downhill bike. Here's some shots here I think of Danny Hart's bike. Now their bike brakes perfectly well, so I can only think that they were thinking like Fabian to basically increase brake squat, to give the bike increased traction so you can really like get hard on the anchors and actually give the bike more grip rather than less. Uh, but super cool tech, I think, that can be had from braking on a bike, just something you just don't see so much these days. Okay, now onto something a bit smaller and a bit more amusing. This is the Onza HO clipless pedal. Now in the 90s there was effectively an arms race to drop any weight off bikes possible to bring out the lightest possible components. People were even drilling components out like it was madness. Now if you think about SPD pedals and other clipless pedals at the time, they had a lot of metal moving parts on them. It was really hard to make a light one. 
and this is where the Onza HO came in. So this one isn't the titanium one, but it had a titanium axled version. It was extremely light, fairly cheap, but made even lighter by the fact it doesn't have springs. It has elastomer rubber in instead of mechanical springs on there. Now, the cool thing about this is they're extremely light because it's just rubber in place of metal springs and metal moving components like jaws. But the downsides at least were the uh, riding traits you got with them. Now, they come with different gyrometer of rubber, uh, ranging from soft to extra firm. So, if you had small feet, you wouldn't be getting into the extra firm ones. But if you're riding in hot conditions, you'd be in and out straight away. In cold conditions, the rubber would firm up. So not only would it be hard to get in, but it'd be extremely hard to get out. And I remember people actually, back in the day, not being able to get out at all at races, like constantly. This was actually a bit of a laughing joke, but somehow, because of the fact they were extremely light, people would forgive them for that. And quite often you'd see people uh, stripping their pedals down, and because it was so simplistic, just basically taking the paint off them and having them like a raw finish. I still think they're a really lovely piece of kit, and these ones are still feeling really nice. Uh, amazing set of pedals there, really cool to see. But uh, kind of laughable if you think that the, the major fact that made them work actually held them up as well. So uh, yeah, definitely a strange bit of tech, that one. Okay, so next up is, is actually my favorite piece of mountain bike tech of all time, and it's a retro piece of tech, the Tioga Disk Drive. Now these came out in around 1992, and they shocked everyone because they looked so different and they sounded insane. Now, I can't give you any footage of how they sound because I don't have any, but they made a crazy rumbling noise. So make no mistake, this is not a disc cover. They're not spokes under here. This is the structural part of the wheel. Now, there were two models of these. There was the traditional version, which is known as a disc drive comp. It's slightly blue, like you can see on screen here, and it had a metal lattice design with the Kevlar cording, which basically goes around the wheel to tension it all. So that's known as the geodesic webbing. Now, this is the pro version that came a bit later that lost out on some of that uh, metal lattice to save weight. It meant it wasn't quite as strong, but it lost a load of weight, so won a lot of fans at the same time. Now, they were insanely expensive. We're talking about 400 quid uh, in the early 90s with no rim, no hub. Okay, that was just the, just the kit. So if you think comparatively, spokes uh, were about 16 quid to build up a, an, a comparative wheel, basically, instead of having a disk drive set up. Now, what were the advantages for having one of these? Well, you could argue there's a slight arrow advantage, but um, I wouldn't imagine that much on a mountain bike. The big advantage, other than sounding immensely cool and making you look like a hero on a bike, which anyone that remembers these will only remember that, is the fact they gave your bike an element of suspension. Because it's a tension disc, works differently to spokes. Spokes arguably can offer a bit of flex in the wheel, but these offered quite, a, quite an amount of flex. Your rim could actually slightly squash and it would spring back into shape, offering a very small amount of suspension. Anyone that rode, it, rode these will tell you, you'd get loads more grip on the back end of a hardtail bike. So that, in these days, in the racing days, was just unbelievably cool, uh, offering those traits. And it was made very popular by John Tomac. You might not be able to see it, but there's a shot of Tomac. He, in my opinion, is the greatest of all time because he did road, BMX, he, he does everything, uh, doesn't anymore. Uh, you might have heard of his son though, Eli Tomac. He's a bit good on a motocross bike. But um, Tomac made these famous by just, he'd win everything. He'd win the cross country, he'd win the downhill um, on the same bike with the same wheel and just show everyone how it's done every time. One of the most stylish riders of all time Really riding a bike that wasn't fit for purpose if you look at what we used to ride back then. But these things are so insanely cool. And they've actually got a cult following. There's several Instagram pages dedicated to these because they're, they're so good. Um, and they're incredibly rare. I've seen some of these going for a couple of grand, you know, on you know new old stock versions boxed with the bag in the box. That's it's like a serious piece of geek kit. Now, I've got to say a massive thank you to GT Retro Tech Shop for lending us this wheel. They are incredibly hard to get hold of now, and those guys were very nice to send us this wheel. This in really good condition, other than the fact the glue obviously has just perished. It looks a bit powdery under there, but other than that, it's just beautiful to see this thing in the flesh. Very cool piece of kit, but uh, ultimately, it didn't go anywhere because they cost a lot of money. They broke, they were quite delicate, not really suitable for mountain biking. But hey, on a perfectly superficial thing, one of the coolest things of all time and my favorite retro mountain bike thing of all time. Now I want to talk to you about the Unified Rear Triangle or the URT. Now this was a very different suspension design that 
did a lot of things that other suspension designs couldn't do. So if you rewind back to about 1995, every manufacturer was bringing out a different suspension design, each claiming to have its own unique characteristics. Now, there were a lot of people, myself included, who were kind of sat on the fence like, well, that says one is really good at pedaling, but so does that one, and they look completely different, so someone here is like not telling things straight. Now, John Castellano was a mountain biking designer at the time, and he was also on the fence thinking, well, I like the idea of suspension, I like the idea of comfort and control, but I don't want to lose that nice responsive pedaling that my hardtail has. So he set about designing something called the Unified Rear Triangle using his trademarked pivot point known as the Sweet Spot. And this is the bike he designed, the Ibis Sasbo. Now it's a very cool bike and the suspension pivot placement was used on various others like this Schwinn, I think you can see on screen and various others at the time. Now the concept behind this was your rear triangle was literally away from the pivot point. So whatever you did with pedaling, it was nothing to do with activating the suspension. Brilliant stuff. So it pedaled genuinely like a hardtail because it was one. Uh, when you sat down on the bike, it was nice and squishy and comfortable. The downsides, of course, when you're stood up descending on the bike, the suspension did work, but it was very firm compared to how it felt when you were sat down. So the bike kind of had two or three different identities. It's a bit of a strange beast. Nonetheless, it was very popular amongst those who wanted some benefits of suspension, but wanted to retain their pedaling, uh, which is why Ibis furthered the design with a much lighter version of it uh, called the Bow Tie, which is this one here. And notice that it has no pivot point. It uses the flex, almost like a, a leaf spring of titanium there to make it work and deliver five inches of suspension travel. Can you believe that? From flex. How cool is that? Beautiful looking bike, if a little bit odd looking. Now, a few other designers that liked the idea of the URT but didn't quite like its sort of Jekyll and Hyde sort of approach were Trek and Gary Fisher, who came out respectively with their different offerings. So Gary Fisher had the Joshua X and Trek had the Y22, the Y11, well, the Y, the Y series of bikes. And they moved that pivot point much lower down on the bike, which meant, although it still worked better when you sat down, it worked very well when you stood up as well. So it wasn't quite as bipolar, I guess you could say, as the, as the characteristic URT designs with the pivot point being placed quite high on the bike. Super interesting stuff. In fact, I made a video with this Y22 that you can see in this image a few years back. I'm gonna put that in the description underneath. I talk a bit more about the feeling of that bike on there, which actually I think I made the video because it had the original XTR transmission on there. But nonetheless, a super cool piece of kit and it, and it gave birth to some beautiful looking bikes. So a few more shots here of that track on screen there and of that Ibis bow tie. In fact, I know someone who's got one of those Ibis bow ties. I might see if it's in rideable condition because it is a thing of beauty and it's a very, very different bike to look at. But ultimately the URT wasn't gonna stand the test of time because much better designs started to come out as the market started improving, different components came out, suspension shock absorbers got better, like the, all the technology available just made things better for everyone. But I've got to say thank you to John Castellano for actually designing this in the first place because he actually made people sit up and take note. Now if you want to read a bit more about him and this suspension design, which I urge you to do so, please look at the link in the description underneath and here's some screen flow, in fact, um, from the Ibis Bikes website. Now they write loads of cool stuff on their blog and it's all tech information. It's really, really good. I can't urge you enough to go on there and have a look. Uh, the link to this is in the description underneath. It's great reading, I promise you. And the last one to wrap up this video of strange tech is something that's very new on the market. So new, I've not even seen these in the flesh, but Zippon tires. Yep, yep, you heard it right, zip on tires. <laughs> Sounds crazy, doesn't it? So picture this though, two tires and one. It's kind of a bit of a concept here. So you have a slick tire, and if you wanna go off-roading, you can just zip on an off-road tire design. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll leave that one up to you to make your own mind up. I've not seen these in the flesh, I just saw this, and I thought it looked pretty interesting that someone's actually trying to develop this. Ah, oh, well, there we go, there's some uh, pretty strange tech for you. Now, the torsion arms made a lot of sense, didn't they? But they definitely look a bit of a bolt-on Heath Robinson approach, which is why I guess you see modern suspension frames don't really have that sort of thing built into them. And uh, well, as for the Turgo disc drive, I'm a huge fan. Um, I should have said, actually, they were brought to the market originally by Sugino, um, and they were licensed by Tioga that actually did the proper work to actually really get them out there, uh, get them seen by people and desired by people like me. Um, what was your favorite bit of tech from this video? Is there anything you agreed with, anything you disagreed with? 
did I forget anything, more importantly? I reckon there could be a part three if you can give me some good enough suggestions for things to talk about. Doesn't matter if it's retro, doesn't matter if it's new, anything that's really strange in terms of mail by tech, we love telling you about it. So uh, get involved in those comments underneath and we'll see you in the next video. See you later.